Welcome to the Hell Creek Formation in Montana with a rather suitable lightning lecture image. I took this photo at a T-Rex site that we were excavating a few years back and uh, I thought it fit the bill. Uh, the rocks you see here were the last geological gasp of the Cretaceous period for this part of the USA, but also for dinosaurs globally, albeit they were represented by multiple contemporary geological formations. Here I want to explore the value, yes, value of extinction in relation to the evolution of life on Earth. But before we start looking at this relationship, we should ask, what is extinction? Now, the French scientist Georges Cuvier was the first to postulate that extinction occurred. This story began in the limestone mines of Maastricht in the Netherlands, where miners often found the fossilised shells of marine fossils. But Sometime between 1770 and 1780, they discovered some huge jaws. Now, these were excavated and put on display just outside the town of Maastricht. However, during the French Revolutionary Wars in the 1795 Dutch Republic campaign, these jaws were liberated and um, they were then transported back to Paris as a spoil of war. It was possibly Cuvier who had requested this acquisition, as many had already heard of this remarkable fossil. Around this time, Cuvier had also been working on some fossil remains of a rather strange-looking straight-tusked elephant discovered in the Plaster and Paris mines of Montmartre. Now, Cuvier came to the conclusion that these fossils were the remains of species that had become extinct. The recognition that extinction occurs in the past was a huge leap forward that would enable a better understanding of the twists and turns in the evolutionary tree of life. Extinction would also permit one of the biggest ideas in modern biology to be formulated. It explained why we don't live on a very crowded planet and provided the launch pad for the work of two brilliant natural scientists from the 19th century who we will soon meet. Here we can see an evolutionary tree of life with occasional small extinction events pocked throughout time. But some are related to much larger mass extinction events, such as that of the dinosaurs. Now, that big idea that I refer to in modern biology is, of course, natural selection or Darwinian evolution. Alfred Russell Wallace had one of the, his many moments of genius in 1858. Yes, he had many. And it took him two days to write his draft ideas when he was sat on the island of Ternata in what is now Indonesia. This letter was sent to Charles Darwin. Imagine that day when 20 years of your life's work are summarised in an unsolicited letter that, that, that lands on your doorstep. That letter from Wallace must have been a bolt from the blue for Darwin. Now, Darwin did not formulate his evolutionary ideas until at least two years after his return from the voyage on HMS Beagle. Darwin had been searching for solutions to explain the distinct speciation observed in the Galapagos Islands. He had two choices, really. Divine creation or natural evolution. The latter, descent with modification or Darwinian natural selection, soon became the backbone to understanding the endless forms most beautiful that populate Earth, both past and present. But let's take a closer look at extinction. The background extinction of individual species occurs throughout the evolution of life on Earth. This is when species can not adapt to change in an environment or to pollution, maybe population growth or other factors or has evolved into new forms that can deal with such change, outcompeting the prior species for resources. However, occasionally, the evolution of life has had to deal with even bigger headaches, the largest being mass extinction events. This is when a large number of species go extinct within a relatively short interval of geological time. Months to maybe hundreds or thousands of years, such duration and impact are frustratingly hard to refine from the geological record. Potentially the most rapid mass extinction event was the last one to impact our planet. This is the one that wiped out the dinosaurs 66 million years ago, bar of course their descendants, the birds. There have been many hypotheses generated on how and why and when the dinosaurs went extinct, but some are just 
a little far-fetched. But what is often forgotten about the reign of the dinosaurs is that their global domination for over 160 million years began with the largest of the five known mass extinction events. The third and largest of the mass extinction events was at the end of the Permian period, some 251 million years ago. This event radically changed the basic taxonomic composition of marine life for the whole planet and really had a major impact on land as well. Just in the marine life, though, the crinoid, coral, bryzone and brachiopod dominated Paleozoic faunas were replaced by the more modern uh, fauna of bivalve mollusks and coiled gastropods and echinoderm dominated communities that you might well recognise today. The first dinosaurs evolved around 230 million years ago in the Triassic. There was a significant extinction about 225 million years ago that removed many of the, re the remaining Permian species. However, the planet's fourth mass extinction occurred at the end of the Triassic. The primary cause is related to tremendous volcanism in the interior of the then supercontinent of Pangaea. This was the beginning of the end of Pangaea, as this vast landmass started to break up, thanks to the planet's dynamic crust slowly moving the Earth's tectonic plates through time. Over long periods of time, this led to massive pulses of environmental change that were too much for many organisms to adapt to. Non-dinosaurian beasties were hard hit, with no serious competition remaining, Dinosaurs radiated into numerous forms, thanks to another lucky mass extinction event. Dinosaurs now ruled the Earth, but that is another story that I must skip to the end, as this reign ended with the Earth's last mass extinction event. Here you can see our University of Manchester field team scrambling around on the rocks that are now named the Hell Creek Formation. They are some 68 to 66 million years old and contain the fossil remains of some of the most iconic dinosaurs to have walked on the planet, such as Triceratops and T-Rex. Here we are just below the boundary between the Cretaceous and the Paleogene, abbreviated to the KPG boundary, or KT for folks who went to school in the same geological period as me. This horizon marks the fifth and final of the Earth's mass extinctions in the geological record. Almost all of the large vertebrates on Earth, in the sea and in the air, meaning all dinosaurs, plesiosaurs, mosasaurs and pterosaurs, abruptly went extinct about 66 million years ago. Most plankton and many tropical invertebrates, especially reef dwellers, also became extinct, and many land plants were also affected. The extinction event marks the end of the Mesozoic era that comprised, of course, the Triassic, Jurassic and Cretaceous. The KPG mass extinction was worldwide, affecting all the major continents and oceans, as it was for all prior mass extinction events. There seem to be five common causes cited for the KPG extinction. Many of these causes are linked to each other. One might well activate another that might cause additional ripples in the extinction pond. However, there are two that seem to come out of the blue. These are volcanoes, good old volcanism, and meteorite impacts. These are part of the Dakan Traps in, in northwest India that began forming around 66.5 million years ago, roughly half a million years before the end of the Cretaceous, and continued till after the mass extinction event. Around one and a half million square kilometres of lava spewed out from the Earth to a total thickness of about 24,000 metres. This caused a global average drop in temperature of some two degrees Celsius. This was a function of sulphurous and other volcanic gases emitted by these eruptions. Now, the impact of the Dakan eruptions is not obvious when reviewing global biodiversity at this time, but there will always be debate on this point. However, it was the sudden impact of a large meteorite at the end of the Cretaceous that has gained most traction in the last 40 years. 
Now, Earth is no stranger to impacts. This is Meteor Crater, also known as the Barringer Meteorite Crater. It is located near Winslow, Arizona in the USA. The crater was made 50,000 years ago when a 50 meter diameter nickel-iron meteor impacted Arizona when traveling at around 50,000 kilometers per hour. This dislodged around 300 million tons of rock with the energy of more than 20 million tons of TNT. All we need to do is look at the moon to see evidence of meteorite impacts over the millennia. It has caught quite a few earthbound objects as evidenced by its cratered surface. So next time you look up at the night sky, remember to say thank you. Unlike our moon, our dynamic earth means that plate tectonics and continental drift might destroy much of the evidence of impacts, especially if one lands on ocean crust that might end up being subducted beneath continents. However, if there has been an impact, there might be other clues that we can look for. In 1980, the Nobel Prize winning physicist Louis Alvarez was asked by his geologist son Walter to help analyse some samples from a KPG boundary site in northern Italy. The layer that they analysed was surprisingly enriched in the rare earth platinum group element, iridium. Since iridium enrichment is common in asteroids, but very uncommon on Earth, they suggested that their chemical signature, which has since been found globally, was down to the impact of a meteorite and was the cause for the terminal Cretaceous mass extinction event, wiping out the dinosaurs. Alas, at that time, there was no obvious gaping hole in Earth that was the right age to be the impact site. However, previously in the late 1970s, an oil company undertaking a magnetic survey in the Gulf of Mexico near the Yucatan Peninsula made a chance find. One of the geologists noticed their data showed a large concentric set of onshore gravity anomalies, about 180 kilometres across. But the oil company would not let the geologists publish this work. Not until 1981, when they published their data at a conference, and so the KPG Crater of Doom was identified. It is now widely accepted that the KPG impact event was the kill mechanism, as evidenced by a vast 25,000 square kilometre crater beneath the Yucatan Peninsula. Remember, Wales is a little under 21,000 square kilometres. The impact had an estimated diameter of between 10 and 12 kilometres and delivered an estimated impact energy of around 100 million megatons. The largest nuclear device yield was around 50 megatons. As the impactor smashed into a shallow marine carbonate platform at 64,000 kilometres an hour, that's 20 times faster than a bullet, it punctured a crater that was 30 kilometres deep. That is more than three times the height of Mount Everest. In what was an almost instantaneous descent, certainly from a dinosaur's perspective, this impactor compressed the air below it so violently that it became several times hotter than the surface of the sun, blasting debris around the globe, including to what would become one of our new dig sites, Tanis, 3,000 kilometres away in North Dakota, USA. Just to help visualise the size of the KPG impactor, uh, a rather scaled up, this is hand sized, the Middlesbrough meteorite, but it is beautiful, little stony chondrite. But also, let's now look at the resulting hole against the south of England now. Some suggest that the pressure of the atmosphere in front of the asteroid started excavating the crater before it even touched Earth. A mass extinction event is the ultimate evolutionary reset button, deleting huge tracts of the ecological slate, but at the same time creating space for life to adapt, diversify and thrive. The planet adds a rather interesting dynamic geographical twist to such events. Where the oceans and land sit relative to each other on our planet is a function of the global ballet of plate tectonics and continental drift. This changing geography also has huge implications for the direction that life might take after an extinction event. 
How life recovers is often down to where on earth you are sat relative to events, as this will ultimately determine the resources available to you, the prevailing climate, and what your evolutionary cohort might look like that you share your particular corner of the planet with. When we look back at the last mass extinction event, we can all agree that the non-avian dinosaurs became extinct. But also 80% of Cretaceous mammals went extinct, and 83% of lizard and snake species went extinct, and giant crocs, and lots of birds. But there was still enough biodiversity to repopulate the Earth, minus the dinosaurs. The post-impact communities start with low diversity, but soon life gets a foothold and disaster species begin to flourish and life rebounds. This post-mass extinction recovery can be remarkably fast. Mammals diversified rapidly after this last mass extinction. And only after a few millions of years, some mammals were then growing a thousand times larger than their Cretaceous ancestors. The evidence suggests that dinosaurs went extinct due to a bit of bad luck, a function of cosmic impactor pinball. Nothing suggested that their reign was going to come to an end until the very last day of the dinosaurs. The rapidity of this extinction marks the KPG event as a little unusual when compared to prior mass extinctions, but nevertheless, it still freed up environments globally that were rapidly occupied by post-disaster species. We must never forget that the age of the dinosaurs was born from extinction. The age of the mammals is also a child of mass extinction. The ebb and flow of the evolution of life on Earth is without any doubt entangled with extinction. We should also remember that some dinosaurs, um, but not all, are still thriving today, with over 10,000 feathery descendants flapping around the planet. Hopefully, the hindsight that the fossil record affords us will help us better understand this intimate relationship between evolution and extinction. If we do this, we might just help prevent the sixth mass extinction. So let us think on how we might use this hindsight from the fossil record and start to live more sustainably and equitably with life on Earth. Thank you for watching and a huge thank you to the amazing ICAL team at the University of Manchester, but also the scientists who we work with globally that make this research possible. Thank you.